Hello and welcome to part three of my series on gamma spectrometry with the Gamma Spectacular. Today we're going to do some uh, spectrometry using the PRA software or Pulse Recorder and Analyzer written by Marek Dolleser. This is a free software and can be downloaded from my website. If you are familiar with other gamma spectrometry packages, then um, PRA shouldn't be too much trouble for you. There is also in the instruction manual a quick setup guide, but some people find a video can be more easy to follow. So uh, let's do that. But before we go there, we just going to have a quick look at detectors. Uh, today I'm going to do the um, experiment with a uh, what I call a general purpose detector. This is a 1.5 inch sodium iodide detector. And uh, why I call it general, general purpose is the size of the crystal. And this is something that comes up very, very often uh, with beginners. Uh, I get asked what's the difference between a one and a half inch detector, two inch detector and three inch detector, etc. And the only difference is what we refer to as the efficiency. And the efficiency is a measure of how efficiently the detector or the crystal absorbs the higher energy gamma rays. So as a gamma ray becomes more energetic, it also becomes more penetrating. And once you get over 1 MeV, 2 MeV, 3 MeV and so on, the gamma ray becomes so penetrating that it will go th directly through two inches of uh, sodium iodide without interacting at all with the, with the contents. Uh, I think the, from memory it may be something like 50% efficient at two inches. That means that half the gamma rays go directly through the crystal without interacting. So this is what we refer to as efficiency. So if you are interested in gamma rays up to one and a half MeV, then a crystal like the one and a half inch detector I have next to me here is fine. But if you want to look at the gamma rays up to and above three MeV, then you will need something to see those uh, gamma rays more efficiently. So that would be something like a, a three inch detector, which is also exp more expensive and much heavier to work with. So it really comes down to what your needs are. And uh, if you're only interested in the X-ray spectrum, then you want a detector with a very, very thin crystal because you don't want the interference of the higher energy gamma rays and you want to catch those low energy gamma rays and they can be absorbed by a crystal as thin as one or two millimeters. So it really, it's really important to uh, pick a detector which suits the purpose of your experiment. Okay, now let's go on to the experiment and I'll do a quick setup and show you how this works. So here we can see that I have the uh, GS USB Pro connected to the GS1515 sodium iodide detector, the uh, USB cable connected to the computer, the SHV coaxial cable connected to the detector. So this is a single wire detector. And the first thing I check here is that the sound card has shown up on my computer in the audio settings. So that indicates that the computer has recognized the audio codec in the GS USB Pro. So that will be your step number one. Okay, so we have switched to screen view. And as you can see, I am operating on an iMac here, but everything will look exactly the same in Windows. PRA is a native Windows application, a .exe application, and does not require any special install. You can run it uh, directly from the app itself or even uh, have a copy of the app on a thumb drive and run it from there. The first thing we are going to do is um, check that our sound card is connected and that we have the right sample rate set. So we open the audio interface and we switch it here to the USB audio codec, which is the spectrometer. And we set the sample rate to the maximum available, which is 384,384 uh, kHz, 16 bits and left channel. The output device is of no relevance. You can leave that as your default and click OK. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to open the data acquisition and analysis window, which is essentially your settings window. And I want to focus a little bit in on this one and uh, go through the various settings so that we're all clear on what they do and what their functions are. 
Okay. This, is the, uh, this is the data acquisition and analysis window and I want to focus in on that and uh, go through each of the settings and explain what they do and what their purpose is. The first setting we come to here is the pulse height threshold. Now this basically discriminates pulses under a certain pulse height. By default I recommend setting this to around 0.3 which is enough to uh, discriminate any electronic noise coming from the spectrometer so that we mainly focus on catching the actual pulses that come from gamma and x-rays. Now one thing to note with this particular setting is if your detector or spectrometer setup happens to produce a negative pulse this number needs to be set to a negative number so the equivalent negative number for that but with the GS USB Pro the pulse is always positive. The next field along here is the uh, boost gain. Now that in most cases should not be necessary but if you happen to have a detector with a very weak pulse you can boost the gain here and increase the amount of gain. The next field here is very important and that is called the shape method. PRA uses a unique system of checking the shape of each pulse before it records it for a gamma spectrum. Now this is important because when you are recording a gamma spectrum there will be pulse pileup and particularly when you're operating at the higher count rates. So this is where two or more pulses occur at the same time and create a double or triple pulse. This in itself creates a distorted pulse and will work out to the wrong pulse height when it's integrated across the time of the pulse. So what we do in this case is we want to discard the badly formed pulses. And the way we do it is to first record the mean pulse shape and then compare every single pulse coming from the detector against the mean and if the variation is outside the tolerance the pulse is simply dropped. Okay and the fi figure under the tick box for the use shape method is the tolerance and you can think of that as a percentage. So in this case we're allowing a 10% tolerance on the pulse shape and anything which is outside of that tolerance will simply be discarded. This means that you may sacrifice some of your count rate for a higher resolution. Now the only time you would leave this unticked is if you are doing an experiment where you are purely interested in number of counts and not so interested in the resolution of the spectrum. The next field here is the channel selection. So we are operating at the moment with one spectrometer and one detector through the left channel. So we are recording the left channel. But if you were using multiple detectors and multiple spectrometers then you would be using both the left and the right stereo channel of the sound card. These parameters is simply the beginning time and duration time uh, in seconds. So you can you can limit your experiment to record 1000 seconds or 10,000 seconds or a number of seconds if you wish and then the software will stop after that time. The next field is the um, advanced filter and we won't be covering that in this video. Counting rate versus time this gives you a histogram of count rate, so basically how many counts per second and you can adjust the bin size and it's by default set to one second but if you set this to 60 seconds then you will get counts per minute. Um, then you have your counting rate histogram which is a histogram of what your count rate is rather than counts per second. Interval histogram is the histogram of the time between pulses. So this may be of interest to some. And the pulse width histogram shows you, as it obviously, the pulse width. Then finally the pulse height histogram, and that's something we need to talk a bit more carefully about because this is the equivalent of the number of channels on a traditional multi-channel analyzer. 
The traditional multi-channel analyzers often came with a thousand channels or 10, 24 channels and so on. Whereas with sound card spectrometry, it, uh, the, the maximum number of channels is 64,000, which is way more than you would need. So we can arbitrarily set that to as many channels as we like. For well, the sound card dynamic range is from minus 100 to plus 100 arbitrary units. So when this is set to 0.1, we are looking at 1000 channel division in the range 0 to 100 arbitrary units. These tick boxes are obviously as they're described here. This one is if you're using calibration. This one is if you're using the Gaussian correlation, which we will explain later. This one converts your graph to log scale. This, is, this refers to the pulse height histogram. And there's also a background subtraction feature, which I will probably cover in another video. Otherwise, this one will get a bit too long. And uh, this one here gives you the sum quantity, which is another way of saying it gives you, converts the um, pulse height histogram to energy per bin rather than counts per bin. And I find that feature quite useful. The next window we are going to open is the count rate versus time, counting rate versus time. This window simply shows you how many counts per second by default, but you can change the time interval here to every 10 seconds uh, or 60 seconds or whichever time interval that you're interested in. But we shall leave it at one second for the moment and click apply on that one. And then the final window we're going to open here is a pulse height histogram, which is obviously your gamma spectrum that we're going to look at. And uh, probably for to see what's going on, we also open the audio input window, which gives us a graphical representation of the sound card input, which is a bit like a poor man's oscilloscope. And the first thing we are going to do is to teach the software what the pulse shape from our detector looks like. Now, in order for PRA to do pulse shape discrimination, it needs to know how a good pulse shape looks. Each detector and each spectrometer might have a slightly different pulse shape. So it's important that we teach the software how it looks before we start. And we do that by doing the... So we go to action, start pulse shape acquisition. So now PRA is collecting a large number of pulses and looking at the mean pulse shape. Now there is a mathematical calculation that the software does here, which is explained in more detail when you download the PRA software. There is a very comprehensive manual where Marek uh, explains this method in detail, but it is too complex to go through in this particular video. After collecting a few thousand pulses, we just go to Action, Stop Data Acquisition. And here you can see a panel comes up with 120 numbers. It looks quite confusing. But what this is, this is a numeric representation of the mean pulse shape. If you wanted to, you can simply click the Copy button here and paste this into Excel and plot the pulse shape you'll see what it actually looks like. But all we need to do here for PRA purposes is click OK and accept this pulse shape. And now we are ready to start our spectrum. And we go to Action, Start Data Acquisition. So now we are recording a brand new spectrum and using that pulse shape to discriminate any badly formed pulses. And as you can see, the spectrum shows up very quickly on the screen and becomes more clear as time goes by. We see up here in the counting rate versus time window that this detector is now running at uh, 326 counts per second, okay, which is in the low range. And as you have already suspected, um, I have placed a cesium-137 sample in front of my detector and we can see the typical peak here at 662 keV. But remember, we haven't calibrated our spectrum yet, so what we are seeing along the x-axis of the spectrum 
is the energy in arbitrary units. So we have 0 to 100 arbitrary units, which is the full range of our sound card. So this is important to understand. And you can see that we have our main peak here approximately at 23 arbitrary units, which is a, incidentally a good place to have the cesium-137 peak because this gives you a range right up to about 3 MeV. We can also see some other details here on the spectrum already. Uh, the very tall peak on the left hand side, this is the 32 kilo electron volt X-ray from cesium-137 and uh, there's another peak here at about 80 keV which is the X-ray, the secondary X-rays coming from the lead shield. So we generally ignore this peak because we know that comes from the lead. And then we can also see another feature of the spectrum here which is the Compton continuum which comes from Compton scattering. That's something we can cover in another video if, uh, if there's an appetite for that. But as you can see, the spectrum is uh, coming together quite nicely. Now, when we do gamma spectrometry, we want to know what's happening in a particular region of interest. And we can uh, select our region of interest with PRA simply by clicking on a bin to the left of our peak and pressing the B on our keyboard. Then we select the bin at the end of our peak and press E for end. And we have now selected the region of interest and it will highlight itself in yellow. And when we click anywhere inside the region of interest, we will get some extra information up here, such as the resolution of the detector here, which is 6.8% in this case. And it also gives you the net counts in the region. So this could be very important. While this is uh, running, we can also go and look at some of the other features that uh, we have here to help us analyze our spectrum. Um, there is a very neat um, feature here called Gaussian correlation. If we turn that on, it has a red line overlay on our spectrum, which is the Gaussian average of the of the bins and you can see it enhances the the peaks so it sometimes can bring out peaks which you otherwise aren't able to see and they show up very very clearly with the uh, Gaussian correlation switched on. A, another feature which uh, you might find interesting is obviously the showing the spectrum in logarithmic scale and uh, we can switch that on over here on the uh, data acquisition and analysis and you can see that you see the more typical log scale look. Uh, one that I particularly like is uh, the sum quantity which gives you energy per bin, energy deposited per bin rather than counts per bin and this will have the effect of enhancing the high energy counts over the low energy counts. So as you can see here, these peaks became very small because there's a less energy deposited in those bins, whereas the, uh, the main peak is very tall because that's where most of the energy has been deposited. That's a nice little feature. Now let's uh, stop the data acquisition for a minute and look at the calibration process. Now we happen to know the energy of the cesium-137 peak and we also happen to know the energy of the x-ray peak. So this gives us an opportunity to get a calibration on this spectrum. So let's see how we do that. The first thing we, we would need to do in order to get a calibration is to find the, the peak energy in arbitrary units. So in this case 23. Point we, I think we can call that 23 even for the um, cesium-137 peak. And if we look at the X-ray peak, uh, we can see that that is at uh, arbitrary units 1.3. Okay, so let's go to calibration. And we simply enter these figures here. So we have uh, 1.3. And I'm just going to put a 1 in there for the minute. And we have, um, that is our 32 kilovolt X-ray. And then we had at 23 arbitrary units, we had our 662 cesium-137. And we click apply 
and then when we switch on energy calibration on the data acquisition and analysis panel and apply we can see that the x-axis has changed itself now to energy and we should have 662 right on the uh, right on there so that's as simple as it is uh, we can use multi-point calibration and there is one thing to keep in mind here is that the um, with multiple calibration points you will get a better result with the interpolate option rather than the uh, linear option and that basically will give you if you have uh, let's say five known peaks it will make it linear between the five peaks so it'll be linear from this peak to this peak and from the, this peak to the next peak and so on so that's your calibration method and it's pretty straightforward there is this um, middle column here which is the standard deviation this helps you to calibrate the spectrum more accurately and you can read off the standard deviation here when you click on the region of interest you will see here that the uh, standard deviation when I turn off energy calibration is 0.67 so 0.67 there is the correct figure to put into the standard deviation there and if I do the same for the x-ray peak beginning and the end of that one and choose there you'll see the uh, standard deviation there is 0.04 and that will then give us the correct uh, linearity of the spectrum so that was a brief introduction to pulse recorder and analysis and I hope it was useful and that it will help you set up and run your software quick and easy. Thanks for watching.